the M1 over the world. So we'll come to the day three of the Flyway Youth Forum 2020. Uh, with the theme connecting the Flyway Youth Leaders for tomorrow. So to start a week of the YEW to do the introduction for this session. Great, thanks Nick. And welcome everybody back to the Flyway Youth Forum. We hope that you've had a wonderful week reflecting on the weekend that we passed, that we spent all together. Uh, and we hope that you have uh, gathered all your strengths for this new weekend, the Flyway Youth Forum. So just a few announcements uh, for, for this day. We have uh, selected the participants to be part of the declaration drafting team. Uh, and they've been um, contacted to ask them to, uh, if they'd like to meet up to prepare uh, the declaration. So uh, if you'll go to the next slide, Nick, please, you will discover the new declaration drafting team. And we're very glad to uh, have all these wonderful participants among us. We received a lot of uh, interest in joining the drafting team and unfortunately had to reduce it to, uh, we reduced it to 13, 12 people um, in order to have some very uh, tight-knit discussions at the beginning, but also we will make sure um, everybody's voices are taken into account into the declaration. So we'll have different ways to do that. Keep, um, you can keep updated regarding the situation, youth declaration discussion group, and make sure you get in contact also with the de declaration drafting team members. Um, among the drafting team members, we have Faria and uh, Sheikh from Bangladesh, and I'm, I apologize in advance if, if I'm pronouncing, um, I'm not pronouncing well your names, and you feel free to correct. Uh, Ng from Hong Kong, Poon from Malaysia, Nur Hafiza from Malaysia, Tura from Myanmar, Matthew from the Philippines, Raisa from the Philippines, Mingyu from Republic of Korea, Rosa from Peru, Joa from Benin, and Hugo from Portugal, Portugal. So we, the selection of the drafting team was really uh, done in a way so that we could have a uh, gender balanced team as well as a team that's based from different parts of the flyway, including three people from beyond the flyway to bring also some interesting perspectives um, into the discussion. And we looked at your applications and we looked at your pre-forum surveys, really impressed by everybody that expressed in the um, in the declaration drafting team. So first of all, a big congratulations to those who have made it part to be part of the team. And uh, thanks to everybody for applying. And you definitely have a chance to keep your, your voice heard in this uh, process. So keep uh, updated to next one, please. Next announcement is to uh, also as a kind reminder for everybody to fill each session survey. Um, if you answer all the surveys for each session, then you will get the certificate at the end of the forum. So make sure you do that. And finally, we, as you received on Hoover, an announcement also that we are organizing a party tonight. So don't miss that opportunity and join us at 5.30 Korean Standard Time after all sessions of day three have been uh, successfully finished. And now I'll hand over to Nick so that she can um, take you through the next steps. Thank you, Nick. Okay. Thanks, Tilly's. Okay, so before we get started, um, here are some online best practices that we should do while listening to the session. So please remember to add your name and your country in your Zoom profile if you haven't done so. And then mute your microphone unless you would like to speak. And then if you have any additional questions or comments during the session, use the chat function of the Zoom. And lastly, please note that the session is being recorded. So if you do not wish to appear in the recording, please turn off your video. So before we get started to the session itself, we have prepared some icebreakers for us, for everyone to participate in, so that we could get our energies up before the actual session. Okay, so before that, uh, here is the rundown of the program for day three. 
So as of the moment, we have the local community engagement session, which will be led by Alejandro and Pilar later. And then afterwards, we have the session on field researching and monitoring. And then on 5 o'clock to 7 o'clock, we have the environmental justice and engaging marginalized youth session. So um, you have to sign up for the forum of the environmental justice and engaging marginalized youth if you want to attend this session so that we could provide you the link. So please sign up if you are interested. And then lastly, if you have time and you are interested in networking with the other participants of this forum, we are inviting you to attend at 7.30 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. So it's a one-hour party just for us to network and just get to know each other during the Zoom. So let's get started with the icebreaker. So we have prepared some several puzzles. So the objective is to discover the familiar word, phrase, or saying that is represented by the puzzle, by each arrangement of the letters. So if you're familiar with the rebus puzzle, that's what we're going to do. So if you know the answer to the puzzle, you should chat, um, type down your answer in the chat function and then we will give 15 seconds, 15 to 20 seconds for each puzzle. So it's, um, let's get started. Okay, so for the first puzzle, this is question number one. So if you have any slight idea regarding this puzzle and what it means, just type it down in the chat. Okay, correct. That is Sandy Limian from the Philippines. You got it right. Okay, so next question. We have 15 seconds to answer this rap puzzle. Isn't it exciting? <laughs> Okay, guys, time's up. Any ideas on what it means? No, it's wrong. Okay, so the correct answer for this one is an inside job. Okay, for the third question. Okay, thanks, Sandy, for, for participating again. How about the others? Please chat any of your ideas for... Also, unmute also if you want. If you want to talk, please unmute. Okay. That's right, Carmen. Army Eileen. Okay, yeah, that's correct. That's split decision. Okay, thanks again. Okay, the Philippine team is leading. How about the other countries? Okay, this is the fourth question. I'm sorry, what does it mean? I can't understand Spanish though, Alejandro. Okay, that's Jasmine. Okay, she got it right. It's top secret. Okay, the next one. The next question. That's right again. Yo no, okay. That, that is cross -feed. Okay, on to our sixth question. Okay, this is very easy. We will get it right. Okay, that's Sandy and Yona again. Forgive and forget. Okay, that's right, Sandy. Okay, next question. Okay, this is kind of hard. I had a hard time figuring this out a while ago. Okay, how about the others? Okay.
Okay, let's get on. Yeah, we got to try. Almost, almost, almost. It's almost. You're still lacking. I give him one chance again. Okay, let's try. Let's see. Oh, no, again, it's two thumbs up. And then, okay, on to our eighth question. Okay, read between the lines. How about the others? What do you think? Does it just mean? Okay, almost time's up. Any answers? Okay, this is for once in my life. Okay, and then the ninth question. Okay, we're almost done. Any ideas what this is me? Okay, that's right again, Sandy. It's six feet below the ground. Okay, killer. Almost, almost there. Okay, with the last question that we have. Okay, this is kind of hard. Hope someone gets it correct before we start the actual session. Any ideas? Okay, okay, time is up. Okay, the right answer is under eye circles. Okay, so with that in mind, um, I'm taking the icebreaker to a close. So let's get back to Elise to introduce our speakers for today. Thank you very much, Nick. What a Nick, what a very fun icebreaker. I knew like two only, I think. And we've got a very tight competition between uh, Yono and uh, Sandy. So I don't know if you guys know each other, but you guys seem to be very good at this. <laughs> so thanks a lot, Nick. Actually, uh, for next session, make sure that you explore Hoover, uh well and get to know your your other peers because we'll have a little fun icebreaker around that. So make sure you take some time to explore the Hoover community. Um, so now without further ado, I would like to uh, pre present our wonderful trainers for this session on local community engagement. Um, so we have Alejandro, Alejandro Betancourt, who is a young from Colombia. Uh, he has experience uh, in designing, planning, and implementing participative sustainable development projects, and he currently works on food security and mangrove uh, particip participative restoration projects as a social facilitator with communities from the Pantanos de Sempla Biosphere Reserve in southeast Mexico. So he holds a bachelor's degree in soci sociology from the National University of Colombia and a master's in uh, natural resource and rural development from El Colegio de la Frontera Sur in Mexico. You can get to know um, Alejandro a little bit more in the e-program that we've sent around also. There's a, a little more description about all the amazing work that he's been doing and take the opportunity to meet him through this particular session. I would also like to uh, present Pilar, uh, who is a young researcher from Bogota, also in Colombia. And she is a biologist and has a master's degree in biological sciences from the Universidad Nacional de Colombia. She is a doctor of science from the University of um, Autónoma de México. And she is currently a fellow researcher and teacher at the Universidad Autónoma del Carmen, also located in Mexico. So ecological restoration of tro tropical ecosystems is her main research topic, and she has been working for more than 15 years on it. Recently, she has been more involved and interested in coastal ecosystems like mangroves 
and participative re restoration processes developed with local communities. So Pilar and Alejandro, along with their team, have developed a really interesting project in Pantanos de Centla, and we are delighted to have them here today to share their work with you guys and to share their learnings. So without further ado, I will hand over to uh, Pilar and Alejandro. Thank you, Nick. Well, thank you, Liz. And thank you as well for Bibian and all the team of uh, the U and the EAAFP uh, group. Uh, we're very glad and we thank you for having us here. I, I'm going to uh, give a welcome to the, all the participants of this first Flowway Forum to this local community engagement workshop. And um, we want to start saying that we wish that every one of you and your relatives are uh, going well and are safe in regard to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So uh, I would like to start saying that please very, feel free to write your comments or questions during the oral presentation uh, because we're, all, we're going to keep on track of this and we will answer it uh, at, the, at the end of the oral presentation. I will also say that this session will be recorded. So uh, as the, my, the team colleagues said, uh, if you don't agree with this, we suggest you to turn off your camera. So I'm going to start to share my screen. Uh, so, could you please tell me if you are seeing it right now? Yep, thank you. We can see well. Okay, so what well, we are going to start uh, talking about the contents of this workshop. So uh, regarding the contents, the first point is our overall presentation. Uh, we'll be um, talk about main concepts and approaches related to participatory biodiversity conservation. Uh, we're gonna talk about the key pr principles of par participatory biodiversity conservation initiatives. We're gonna then uh, talk to you about our own experience mm, doing a participative ecological restoration process. Uh, we want to show you some insights, methods, tools, and um, learn lessons from the Pantano de Centla Biosphere Reserve. Uh, we also, at the end of the oral presentation, are talking about uh, the local capacity strengthening um, topic. We are going to show you some insect insights and also some learning experience. Uh, from this learned uh, lesson from this experience. Um, then after the, after the oral presentation, we are gonna respond the questions that you uh, are gonna write um, during the, the presentation in, in, by the chat. And then we are gonna facilitate a small group open discussion in order to keep reflecting about the participatory conservation of biodiversity. So the idea is that you're gonna be sent randomly to a breakout group and you will also be given a mirror link for you to write and share your thoughts. So uh, we sincerely encourage you to feel free to express kindly your opinions and your ideas about two, three qu key questions that we are going to give. And um, this is meant to follow the discussion. So at the end, uh, we're going to and make a plenary. Uh, you are going to make a uh, come back to the Zoom main room in order to, to hear a small group summary to, of the discussion. We will select randomly some people to be the speaker of the group. And uh, we, you're going to give us, these speakers are going to give us a small brief of the yes expressing during the small group discussion. This is for us to know what happened in the in the discussions and to make a uh, closing. So let's start. Uh, I would say also that the objectives is important to know it because well we have four of them. The first one is that we want to introduce the concept of community-based conservation and the participative ecological restoration. 
The second one uh, is to describe the importance of the role of local communities in wetlands conservation. The third, we want to share you some tools and methods on how to approach, engage with local communities effectively for a participative project. And finally, we are going, we want you to, we want to share the experience of the successful local community engagement and your involvement for the conservation of, of wet. Okay, so let's start. The first reflection that I want you to, to share you is related to the question on who makes biodiversity conservation. I will say that there are at least three kinds of factors that normally leads these initiatives. There are, these are communities, technicians, and governments. I will also say that there are two kinds um, of initiatives in relation to biodiversity conservation. Those who emphasize just in the achievement of the conservation goals, we will name it the top-down approaches, and those that are led by communities. The ones that are led by communities are commonly related to the declaration of natural protected areas and are implemented mostly by technicians. This approach, as I said, is the top down and those in the, in the contrary or in the other hand, those where the communities are the key stakeholders are focused in local well-being and are intended to extend it the initiatives to try to conceal between conservation goals and the desire for benefits for communities. We name it the bottom-up approach. Mostly these initiatives are materialized as productive restoration or uh, projects, agroforestry initiatives, forest, land, forest land, landscape restoration projects, and programs among others. This approach, as I told you, is the bottom-up. So let's talk more about this bottom-up approach. So, in the conservation academic and also the practitioners and the governments and also the NGOs, they say or they try to name these approaches as you can see in this, um, in this scheme. There are, not, they, there are several names for them. Common-based management, common-based conservation, biocultural conservation, common pool resource management, integrated conservation and development programs, and also participatory conservation of biodiversity. As you might say, these, all these uh, focuses and approaches has in common the, the, that they want to conciliate the biodiversity conservation objectives and also the desires for benefits to local communities. So I am not, I don't have the intention to define every of those approaches. What we want, what I want right now is to critically define two crucial aspects to reflect on the community-based conservation. The, these two aspects as are what we understand by community and what we understand by participation. So, what do you, we understand by community? Uh, we usually think that communities are isolated rural groups of people. But on the contrary, according to Berkes, a community is a multidimensional, cross-scale, socio-political unit or network, and I focus on network, changing through time. The community is an environmental, is also seen by environmental scientists as a subsystem from the socio-ecological system and is composed by different kinds of ethics, histories, economics, and of world views. So please take this in mind and remember that it's a very, uh, the communities are very complex and are changes always through time. Okay, so secondly, I want to um, reflect on the participation concept. So according to Sullivan, participation represents a way of categorizing the levels of control that individuals and groups hold in terms of designing policies 
in favor of the users. These levels of control can be seen as a participation ladder that can go from the nominal step, where there is no power of decision making from groups, the representative step, where there are several, several actors that intermediate and has uh, different degrees of power for the groups for make them decision. And finally, at the top, we have the transformative step, where groups have higher decrease of power to decide and make decisions. According to Baldauf and also to the conservative academics, conservation academics, um, participation can actually be seen both as a mean or as a name. The first one, as a, as a mean, is referred as a technical concern that most of the practitioners on biodiversity conservation have to rise are intended to rise knowledge level, to involve a great variety of stakeholders, or to solve low concerns like informing or consulting communities when there is a conservation initiative. But on the other hand, we have the focus on the participation and as a name. And this means that and this is related to an ethical a political and even an epistemological concern because it considers that it, it is needed to empower people in order to achieve participation as a fundamental right and this is needed for people to make decisions and because also the complexity of communities as I told you a reflection and this complexity as I told you is made by different worldviews so for that reason, practitioners have, before they start the planning, have to reflect on basic concepts like what is development, what is quality of life, and what do they mean by progress in order to respect these um, community workers. In our experience, we, has, uh, we, we understand participation both as a mean and as a name, because at the scale of initiatives and projects, it is very useful way to dialogue among different stakeholders. It is also very useful to conceal the interests and goals from different uh, stakeholders in, and also to increase the communities and the practitioners knowledge. But on, on the other hand, we also think that it's also participation is also a desired result in order to sustain and innovate outcomes in time for the people to increase their capacities to make more decisions related to the biodiversity management. So as a small synthesis from these reflections, I would say that these concepts uh, uh, that the, part the participatory biodiversity conservation should tailor the, the intervention and not be adaptive to socio-ecological context, taking into account that communities are complex networks that change through time, and for these reasons as well, conservation can have multiple stakeholders and objectives that should be concealed in order to prevent conflict. It is also important to recognize the importance of intergenerational planning and institutions for the initiatives to sustain over time. Incorporate the distinct rights, like the right of participating itself and the responsibilities from all the parties, where confidence relations based on transparency and assertive communication is very needed. So, it is important also to respect and incorporate different worldviews and knowledge systems into the conservation plan. So now, I will. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Pilar Gomez, is going to showcase our personal experience in the macroecological restoration initiative inside the Pantanos de Centla Valley. Thank you, Alejandro. Um, hi, everyone. So I'm going to share my screen right now. Um, 
you told me if you can see it. Now it's white, okay? Yes, white. Well, so uh, briefly, I'm going to share with you uh, our experience um, working with two communities in Pantanos de Central Region. So to do this, I have to take you to Mexico. Um, that here is, uh, if you know, uh, well, Mexico is in North America, just below uh, of United States. And also is well known because of the tequila, probably <laughs> you know you know that. But also Mexico is recognized as one of the most biodiverse countries in the world. And this implies a high responsibility to conserve and restore this richness. Uh, well, as I said, uh, we work in Pantanos de Centla Biosphere Reserve that is located in southern uh, Mexico. In, it's uh, inside a state called Tabasco. And uh, this uh, natural protected area is very important because, um, excuse me, uh, it covers mo the most important wetland complex in Mesoamerica region. So uh, here you can find a great station, extension of mangroves or hydrophytic vegetation. And also is recognized as Ramsar site uh, because the presence of the many uh, migratory uh, species of birds. So uh, we developed here uh, a project uh, the last year and that the main objectives was restore 50 hectares of mangroves inside this uh, biosphere reserve of Pantanos de Centla with two local communities. And well, the framework that we use to develop this project is the participatory ecological uh, restoration that we define uh, as the process of dialogue, planning, implementation, and monitoring of restoration actions developed by academic, governmental, and local actors that have a direct and indirect relationship with the ecosystem that needs to be restored. So we also uh, divide, sorry, uh, this uh, process in three main phases that are planning, implementation, and monitoring. I'm going to tell you more about them. Uh, but before that, uh, we want to share you that we have a fundamental premise uh, to develop this project. And it was that uh, the project must be a collective construction. So. Uh, it means that all decisions of restoration process related to places, actions, methods, and time seasons to develop the activities should be decided by a consensus among the local communities, local authorities, governmental institutions, and the group of the researchers in charge of the project. So uh, at the beginning of the project, uh, one of the most important things is to get the confidence uh, of the people, that people trust in you. So to get this objective for us, uh, we developed several strategies, but two of the most important were, were these those that are participatory mapping with these two local communities are called El Palmar and Tembladeras, and also a frequent dialogue uh, with them about their interests, needs, objectives, and experiences. So the first phase is the planning. Uh, here, as I said, uh, we have a dialogue with the authorities and communities about viability of the project uh, to define uh, goals and objectives. And also we ask them to, con to pass experiences with another projects. In the field, we identify our reference ecosystems uh, that it's very important step in a restoration uh, project because this ecosystem is the guide or that the one that you are going to use to compare the results. And uh, well, in this, in this reference ecosystem uh, site and the potential uh, restoration sites, we did a biological evaluation of the conditions and also a cartographic analysis of the area. 
And then with all this uh, information and also considering the local knowledge, we took uh, the decision of the best restoration actions. Uh, so as I said, uh, we at the beginning had different uh, sessions of consultation with the authorities of the uh, Pantanos uh, de Central Biosphere, Biosphere Reserve because this protected area has an special uh, issues for management. Uh, also, uh, different uh, exercises or sessions about uh, participatory mapping that we call also social cartography, where people uh, show us different elements of the territory. And also a cartographic analysis where uh, we evaluate the land use and tenure, uh, vegetation types, forest fires frequency, and also we did an hydrological model. Uh, well, in the field, as I said, uh, we did an evalu ecosystem evaluation uh, in the mangrove areas and also uh, in areas where the hydrophytic vegetation was much more common. So we evaluate the composition and structure of the vegetation uh, to estimate a species richness, number of individuals, height and diameter at the height uh, at the breast. And also uh, that is very important, the, co the hydrological components. So we took uh, data from physical chemical variables, uh, salinity, pH, temperature, and redox potential. With all those information, uh, we have uh, pues, uh, some uh, valuable uh, data to establish the best ecological uh, restoration actions in conjunction con the, with the communities. So now uh, the phase two, that is the implementation. So we have here two uh, restoration actions that we decide with the communities. For El Palmar, we decide to do a reforestation with Rhizophora mangle. That was, it is the most common species of mangrove in this area. And for Tembladeras community, we did an hydrological rehabilitation. Uh, this is doing by a, a channel cleaning uh, of in the area. Also, in this during this phase, we did a, a different local uh, capacity strengthening activities that my colleague Alejandro will tell you after me. So about reforestation, as I said, uh, here is this image. You can see uh, the red uh, segments are the channels that the community used fish, but this area is almost uh, uh, without any uh, trees or something like that. So they want to recover the mangrove uh, is, is species to uh, get the shadow that mangroves could provide for them to avoid this, this effect of the sun that is very intensive in this area. So, um, we, uh, to, to do this reforestation, we bought uh, the propagules of Rhizophora mangle from a community, another local community that is really close to Pantano de Centla, that it's called Ursulo Galvan. And here I show you the, uh, this is the design of sowing that, that we use for uh, the, 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 for the reforestation. We have three groups of propagules that were sowed uh, near to the borders of the channels uh, and are separate uh, almost six meters. Uh, this activity was done completely by the community during four sowing sessions in uh, 2019. Uh, almost 70,000 propagules were distributed along 34,500 meters of the both sides of the channels and this complete area uh, is equivalent to 20.5 hectares of reforested mangroves. As you can see in the pictures here, there are, here is the people uh, doing the activities and here in, in the map, uh, you can see the, the area. Now about uh, ecological rehabilitation, this was done in Tembladeras community. Uh, this community uh, done several uh, reforestation uh, years uh, before and these mangroves grow really really fast and too much so it caused an obstruction of the hydric channels and with the time the community identified that 
it was a reduction of the fishing activity. And here you can see uh, this is the network of the channels in the area. The red segments was the, the, the channels that we selected to for clean. And also here, the community was uh, in charge of the activities from September to November of uh, 2019. Almost 5,000 meters of channels were cleaned manually, and this represents 34.7 hectares in rehabilitation. Uh, as you can see, uh, the community did this activity with uh, manual tools uh, to remove all the sediments and vegetation that were blocked the channels. And here is the, the area in the map. You can see this is the area of in rehabilitation. And now phase three is the monitoring. Uh, well, the, the main purpose uh, objective here is the evaluation of the implemented actions. Uh, in the case of reforestation, we evaluated the survival and growth of the individuals. And for hydrological re rehabilitation, we took the uh, data for the species that were present in the cleaned channels. Also, we uh, promote uh, the periodic maintenance of the sites in the process of restoration to avoid uh, colonization for fast growing species. And also, we consider that in this phase, it's really important to socialize the results and also the failures on the success of the activities. So now uh, some advances of the reforestation. Uh, we did an evaluation uh, at the beginning of this year uh, and we re recorded a um, survival of almost 75%. That is really good. And as you can see here in the, the picture in the middle, uh, these are the variables that we took uh, to evaluate the growth. There are number of leaves, total height, and two diameters because uh, Avicenia, um, excuse me, uh, Rhizophora, uh, we have to take in account the, the diameter of the problem. Uh, also, uh, well, in, in the case of hydrological rehabilitation, uh, for uh, the initiative of the communities, fishermen uh, install artisanal traps in the cleaning uh, channels to uh, capture uh, the species that are used in the channels, and we detect uh, that in during 20 days, they capture the uh, a, well, a good uh, quantity of, of, of these uh, five species. The more important economically are um, these ones that are shrimps and crabs, that uh, these are the species that the people in this community use to uh, sell in the local markets. So uh, finally, to uh, finish this part of the project, uh, I want to share with you the main project outcomes. And now we have more than 50 hectares of mangroves in restoration process, uh, because you must know that the restoration uh, of an ecosystem is not a uh, process that you can uh, get the best results in a short time is uh, restoration takes a long, long time to recover uh, in a well uh, way the ecosystem. Uh, we have a good engagement of women and young people, so that's also uh, really good to, for us. Uh, an important thing that, that I want to remark is the decision making that were collective and concerted and was based on the, gener and the data that we generate and also in the, with the local knowledge. And this promote uh, an, a project appropriation uh, for the communities that was really, really good to see. Uh, people are more uh, interested to conserve and recover mangroves to preserve the ecosystem services. And for us, this project also was the opportunity to develop uh, science and spread the new knowledge uh, by different means, like two scientific articles, one book chapter, and one video that unfortunately is in Spanish, so we can't show you today and for infographics that are uh, mainly to share with the communities. So now I'm going to uh, give the word to my colleague Alejandro to share with you uh, the other part of the presentation.
Thank you. Well, thank you, Pilar. Uh, I'm gonna continue in the last part of our, our presentation. Uh, okay, excuse me. I think I, I miss. I miss. Okay, so the last part is to emphasis and the local capacity strengthening. So um, this is a very, very important part of our, our implementation strategy because it's, it allows us to um, make more confidence and make, engage more with uh, local communities. Uh, so again, with the concepts, I really love concepts, but, and today I want you to share this kind of theory uh, moment. Uh, I will say that According to PCI, the capacity, uh, the local capacity strengthening, strengthening means to leveraging and expanding existing knowledge and capacity of, of local partners in order to achieve their mission and to create sustainable impacts via local ownership. So strengthening capacity is also useful to engage externally and effective partnering among communities, women, and vulnerable groups. I will say that during our experience in the Pantano de Centro Laboratory Research, we had five different workshops. These ones were uh, related to the concepts of mangrove res restorations, and uh, it was designed in order to construct knowledge and establish a little dialogue between community and technicians. So as you will see, we designed the, the, these workshops for and with communities. So the first workshop is the was called the ecosystem services of mangroves. Uh, it aims that communities recognize and understand the value of the benefits derived from mangroves. At the beginning, we discuss about the um, provision services like food, uh, construction materials, and medicines. Afterward, it was discussed regulatory services of mangroves like tide control, the protection from strong winds, and the tropical storms. And this part is very, very important because these people are um, located very close to the coastline. So for instance, in this time, in this year that we had a lot, a lot of rain and a lot of tropical storms in the Atlantic, it was very useful for them and they realized that the mangroves were very helpful for them to be resilient. So the second training was about ecological restoration technical steps. It aimed to acquaint communities with different technical and logistical aspects in ecological restoration initiatives. We used a self-designed board game as a, as a pedagogical tool for facilitating participation among participants. It allowed us to identify and reinforce concepts and a sequence of actions of the restoration projects. We conclude that community engagement during the whole process is needed in order to sustain restoration process and results. The third training was about was named monitoring activities with mangroves. It was about um, uh, um, uh, it aims to dialogue among actors about current method methodologies for observing mangroves restoration performance and as I, as Pilar said, to evaluate the project. Participants were able to see how to measure um, several variables from the mangrove vegetation. Excuse me. And these variables were about species richness, individual growing, variables of water conditions like salinity, acidity, temperatures, and redox potential. Okay, so the main outcome of this training is that participants learn how to make basic measures of mangrove restoration. Participants also say that they realize why, what for, and how technicians and researchers make this uh, action, these research actions. 
And uh, it is important to highlight that uh, the monitoring activity that Pilar showed show you before, the results, were done with the help of young people that uh, participate in this workshop. So we did this workshop and then we did the, the monitoring of our uh, own project and we realized that people learn very fast and they are very helpful and we believe that in the future they could make their own monitoring of the restoration projects. So afterward, we designed a forest five five bic course for local brigade, brigade, brigades and volunteers in order to talk about basic basics on fire management and fire fight fight. This was a part of our sustainability strategy in the sense of protected of protect the restored techniques, uh, the restored mangroves that we had planned. So we talk about basic concepts of fire, behavior, tools, and strategy for the for coordinate the part line. I forget to tell you that here in mangroves, there, there are increasing the frequency and the intensity of fires that are mainly caused by humans uh, to hunt wildlife. So, and in this map, as you can see, the, this is the frequency of the, excuse me, the frequency of the, of the, um, uh, fires uh, given a, a, a period of time and we have here the El Palmar community where there is a small place here and here we have the uh, restored area and we have here tembladeras that is close to a very 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 uh, uh, like fire play, uh, that a place that uh, has fired the whole year you know? So in this, uh, in this course, we talk about basic concepts of fire behavior tools and strategies for coordinating the fire fight. And uh, we tried that participants were not only from the communities from Palmar and Tebladeras, we invite communities from the other ejidos, the other, the neighbor ejidos, because we, are, we realize that the fire management is, is not just a matter from the locals. It's a matter from the, the, the neighbors in order to do them, they coordinate the, 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 the fight response and to prevent and manage this, this fire use. Finally, we have the, the, the last training that was community experience exchange. This one um, was aimed to promote communication and interaction between locals and other local communities to encourage the development also of sustainable, sustainable activities. We, what we do in this time was not to, to, to teach, we facilitate a visit to local community, to a local community that have a wide experience on mangrove restoration and sustainable use in Tabasco, in the, in the same state. So um, we uh, aim that host community share to visiting community their methods, facilities, and learn lessons in order to visitors replicate them in their own territory. So we had 15 visitors from the two communities, the El Palmar and Tembladeras, that learned about procedures to collect, grow, and sell mangrove, mangrove propagates. They also see local facilities for the charcoal production and the actual legal process that uh, this community, this host community, is, has right now to obtain a blue carbon certification. So, I would like to conclude our, our presentation saying that reflecting on participation on biodiversity conservation give us a set of principles to consider uh, any, any initiative in the, conservative, in the conservation, uh, uh, in any conservation initiative. I will mention a set of principles and factors that are very useful for succeeding on these initiatives that also comes from our now our own learned lessons. The first one, and it's vital, and is that it is needed to understand biology and ecology of the target socio-ecosystem. You saw that we focus a lot when we were planning our actions, and we make a diagnosis of the socio-ecosystem. The, the second is that we 
we have to take into account the principles of common property rights, the history of the community, and the different worldviews that the locals have. This is crucial to understand the community as a complex and, again, an intergenerational multi-stakeholder network. The third one is that economic and social benefit should be derived from the community participation in the co-management strategy. There is no possibility of making biodiversity participatory conservation strategy if you don't think about the, the, the benefits for the people. So, um, in our case, we realized that restoring mangroves should be a part of a long process of mangroves, mangrove sustainable use strategy. The, the fourth one is that it is important to define the physical and geographical boundaries for the resource management. So no matter if the socio-ecosystem has complex interactions between another socio-ecosystem, we have to be, have a very, very important focus on these boundaries. The fourth or the fifth uh, principle that I want to reflect on is that it is crucial to understand and recognize the relationship, the relationship between the community and the managed resource. Because uh, there are several cultural and economical roles of this resource in local livelihood. In some cases, ecosystems are seen as sacred places. And this sacred, this sacrality makes uh, the ecosystem consubstantial to the community well-being. So, for these reasons, we have to understand the participation as a mean and as an end to success in conservation goals, but also to transfer powers for community interests. Three things, the knowledge, the capacity, and the networks. These three things in order to make the mangrove advocacy via legal frameworks to sustain the project, the project via local ownership and to make autonomous decisions in order to dignify their way of living. So this is it. Thank you very much. We want to express a special thanks to the communities of El Palmar and Tembladeras because they take off the ownership of this project with a lot of enthusiasm. We currently work with them in another project and of resilience, of constructing the local resilience. But this one is a, like a small sample of what we did two years ago. So we also think to the, the theme of the four bottle de sapere sustentable. We, we, we talk on behalf of our team. And uh, these logos that you see there are the, the, the fundings, the fundings, the PNET, the yep, projects, the Pantano de Central Biosphere Reserve, the government institutions, and our uh, stakeholders partners. So, thanks a lot. I'm going to stop my share right now. So, I, I don't know, at least if we maybe, I see that there are several uh, questions, but um, I don't know if maybe someone in the public want to express it like via orally and maybe to, to see them, to, 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 to see their faces as well. And we can share some space to some oral space with my, my colleague Pilar. What do you think? Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Alejandro and Pilar. Uh, fantastic presentation. Um, I Yes, we can definitely open the floor. So I see you have already a few questions in the comment box, in the chat box. Uh, but put their questions and anybody else, if you want to unmute your microphone and uh, and share your questions, that would be that would be great. So you, that Alejandro and Pilar can also see you and hear you. I am seeing the, the question right now, I'm reading. I don't know if you, maybe you, Pilar, have created it before, uh, already, so, and you want to to, to respond, to, to, to answer? 
while I read it, maybe? Mm, well, uh, I don't know, I can uh, start with the question of Anthony Duxel. Uh, well, hi, Anthony, I'm Pilar. <laughs> Gomez is my last name. Uh, well, so about the challenges, um, that's that's an import, important issue because, um, well, here in Mexico, uh, there are many, many projects, uh, ecological projects that came to the communities, uh, researchers or technicians uh, developed the actions and then they left nothing <laughs> to the communities. So with the time, uh, the people get um, really, um, I don't know how to say that, uh, well, they don't trust it. Uh, when another group, another institution came to tell them, okay, we want to see, do develop a project here because it's really important. So uh, the, the one of the most important uh, uh, steps in, 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 at the beginning is to talk really openly with no um, egocentrism. <laughs> so we are all people, we, uh, they know a lot of the ecosystem more than the scientists or academics that are uh, in, in other places like me because uh, I'm not resident in this area. I, I, I have to move to, to, to visit the communities. So uh, it was uh, one of the main challenges at, at the beginning. Uh, we have to, to, to start uh, the, the, the conversations, to present us, to uh, share with them our, our objectives, not only for the research, uh, only, uh, well, our uh, objectives in terms of um, social um, and emotional <laughs> interest. So I, I think that if we are honest since the beginning, uh, people can uh, detect that. So uh, they start to open uh, the, to you uh, to talk about the things like hunting, for example, uh, these communities are located inside a natural protected area, so they uh, ha they are the hunting is prohibited. So, uh, but before, so several years before, they they used to hunt because they they eat these these uh, natural resources that provide their ecosystem, and now that is prohibited. So uh, they probably uh, some. Uh, persons of the community, eventually they can do that, but all, obviously they don't going to, uh, they don't going to, to tell everyone that they did that. So, but if we have confidence with the people, people start to share that because they say, well, if, is, if I need to, to eat, I, I can't just only uh, see the animal pass without do nothing. So this kind of events that are really private uh, start to, to, to be sharing by, because the people understand that you are there not only to get a benefit from them, that you are there because you are always sharing with them your knowledge, your interest, your passion for nature, your um, that you respect them as people that also had a lot of knowledge. We have to, to, to consider always that the local uh, communities are really, really, uh, oh well, they have an incredible richness of knowledge that we have to consider always. So if we gave them this kind of um, good relations since the beginning, I think that it's more easy to develop the next phases of the project. Alejandro, I don't know if you want to add something. Yes, yes, yes. I, I want you to also add on this thing because I, I am seeing that the questions are very similar in order to, to ask for the main challenges and also to, to ask for how to deal with conflict and how to engage 
it's like like the the uh, I kind of a semi similar question because we our uh, one of our challenges was to deal with conflicts with the local conflicts and these conflicts are very very complex because uh, some of them were like familiar conflicts you know like very very ancient conflicts but also some of them were related to how the community manage the resource that comes from the government for the conservation projects. What we realize is that this, this, this conflict origins from corruption because uh, there was several actors from government that were paying not to the whole community, but just one person for them to sign the papers to receive some money and the rest of the money was uh, staying on uh, uh, the the actors, the all the government actors. So this was a very very um, conflicting and problematic thing, and for that reason, the people the people thought that we were the same at the beginning. They thought that we worked the same, and they they have this hostility and this uh, unconfidence un to say, okay, are you are you really working what you are gonna say? what you are saying or you just want the money, you know? So well, how do we manage this? With a lot of dialogue, a lot, a lot of dialogue and a lot of negotiation. I say this because every, re, every meeting and every planification uh, gathering was like with the whole uh, um, uh, assembly of the community, and we have to talk with the more the, the oldest people, no? And generally, the, the elder people were the ones that, that were there. And we got to dialogue and to um, explain every single thing that we were trying to do in their territory. And not also to, to saying, okay, we're going to do that. It was also a negotiation because we wanted the, to them to, to, to understand that we were not like the government that to say, okay, you have to do one, two, three, four, and that's it. No. Okay, let's let's say we have these these, these alternatives. We have we can how can we do, do we do this? We ask for them which will be the best way to to do one thing. For instance, in reforestation, we came with one plan, but it changed the whole the whole after we talk with community, after we talk on how do they make the, 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 the sewing. And, uh, and I will say that it's a lot of dialogue and, and, and a lot of, 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 of negotiation. I would say always that, uh, also that um, it is important to face these corruption practices and to gain the confidence from them. Pilar also told it, but and a way to say it, to, to manage this, is to work in very close to communities in order to them to understand that, as I told, as I told you, we are not government, we work different. So we were there in every single step of restoration. We were not only, not only in the diagnosis, not only in the planning, we were also in the implementation. We get inside to the mangrove, we go with them, and uh, basically, we have the sun, and we we have the the same stress that workers have, and that change a lot the way that that they think about us. Because what they say is that the government actors were very fat, that they just drowned in the mangrove, and for that reason, they do not go to the to the to the ecosystem. Um, so. Yes, we demonstrate that we have a different style of working. And to answer just another complete, another question is that, well, they, they say, how do you engage? Well, it is very important, as, as I mentioned, to, uh, to, to come with an alternative. I mean, not just to say, we want to save the planet, we want to sow mangroves, etc. You have to take in mind that people, as the person, let me say who was the person that said, as Tura so mean, 
students, I mean that people are very busy with the daily livelihoods. So this thing is very complex because the time that they're spending on you, they should be doing another two or three things. So the, basically, I think the only way you can manage that is to offer something. No? And in our case, we came with a project, with a, with, a, with a complete project that had the resource, the enough resource for them to pay them for the work that they were uh, doing. So they realized that this was a kind of temporal activity that they were, uh, they would be given a, like, a, like a salary for doing that and that they also recognize the benefits that comes by sowing uh, mangroves or cleaning their channels. And, they, and, and I would end with this. They realized that it was not just money because usually talking about money also makes conflict. People realize that sowing and then looking at a tree um, a growing, well, this is a thing that is gonna, is gonna stay. This is a this is a a good that is gonna stay to the future, and this is like a benefit that is gonna stay for them, and also they uh, value a lot the workshops, the local capacity strength workshop, because they they value a lot because they saw that young people and people that usually do not participate can stay, can learn something, and can use this. Maybe they can use this, this knowledge in the future for other uh, initiatives. I, I also want to, to mention uh, about the, the challenge that we face. It's uh, related with the terms, with the vocabulary, because uh, sometimes uh, people that came from academic uh, institutions or governmental institutions uh, have a um, speech <laughs> that it, in the communities uh, is not easy to understand. So uh, this is one of the uh, most uh, important uh, issues that we, we have to face at the beginning because we, we explain them or we, we propose them. Okay, we are going to restore mangroves. So people at the beginning was what? But what is restore? Uh, restore is just uh, sowing a mangrove or what? <laughs> so we start to uh, try to develop a, voc a vocabulary that was common for all the actors, uh, that was com compressive. And also uh, it was a real challenge for, what, uh, for example, for us that, that came from the academic uh, world that is so technical. Um, sometimes it's really difficult to explain to, 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 the, to the women or young people uh, as, uh, technical aspects of the restoration or the hydrological uh, dynamics or something like that. But when you have a good uh, attitude to explain them with patience and with different examples, people, uh, take it really good and start to, 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 to ask to ask you know so uh, the, this interaction is also really important because uh, you can have a common uh, a scenario to interact uh, with the with all the actors and uh, you then can replicate this with other communities and the this, the 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 proper communities el palmar and, and tembladeras uh, they have uh, talked about uh, this project this experience with other communities so uh, it uh, let um, like a, or well it's like a, another step uh, for us in the gain it to 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 in, in, increase the, the the number of communities that we are going to or we want to work in the area, and and this is really really an issue that that I think that it's a challenge in all the the, the projects the, to to explain to share with the people 
what are the terms and what are the topics and what are the definitions and what is important. Uh, at the, in, the, in the workshop of the ecosystem services, uh, for example, people, it's, it's very conscious about they need or they use uh, wood uh, that they fish, but never before uh, somebody said, but these are ecosystem services that Mangroves provides you. So they start to think, oh, okay, ecosystem services, and well, you know that this is a topic that worldwide uh, is, is, is really, really used. So uh, I think that, that, that the, 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 this is another challenge that, that is really frequent in this kind of project that are uh, related with the communities. Thanks a lot, Pilar and Alejandro. Maybe we have time for a few more questions. These are so, so insightful uh, comments and um, really interesting. I see, I see a lot of the questions in the group being around challenges. Uh, and really, I, I, un I understand from the questions in the group that a lot of the young people here are experiencing these challenges also in engaging with local community. Um, Maybe one question also is uh, in terms of timing. How long have you got? Were you guys in the there working with the community? How far in advance did you start these dialogues? And maybe uh, how long did it take until you went to the implementation phase? Okay, well that that's a good question because we uh, we started going to the communities in 2017 of uh, like almost two years before we in fact start the project and this was uh, like a very well it, it was because we uh well, we were, we were engaged with uh planning uh, uh, like a very high scale planification uh, that was made by the government they were well and the UNDP they were trying to uh, actualize uh, and refresh the, the management programs of the natural protected areas. So for this reason, they like make very big meetings uh, between uh, uh, multi-stakeholders in order to start to refresh the things, the concepts, and the, basically the vulnerability in uh, uh, to climate change of inside of the natural protected areas. Uh, we um, we we supported uh, one part of this concept and uh, one part of this uh, planning that was uh, the topic of the risk, the reduction of the risk on the on, on the risk disasters. Okay, I, I don't know, I don't know if I'm saying okay, but it's kind of disaster risk reduction. Okay, and um, for doing that, we made several workshops with the communities that after that we, we work it, no? And we first diagnose this kind of vulnerability, the things that people do for uh, adapting to climate change. And after that, we realized that, that uh, there was a possibility to uh, continue with this, plan with this planning uh, by implementing um, an action that was direct uh, re related to the to this this plan and we basically uh, signed for like a like a a, a project uh, survey they give us the, the opportunity to make this to fund this this project and we continue with the same communities with two of the five communities that we started in 2017 but it's like a, a i mean it, it can sound that it, it should, could sound that it's two years or, or three years is, 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 is a little, no? But I think it's, it's enough time to uh, start to make this confidence relationship to design a plan that has an impact in the locality and to also monitor and to be and to see results. I think that is enough time to start to see because normally people uh, get sad because they they work and work and work and they don't see uh, like outcomes. 
but I, 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 I encourage people here to keep working in these initiatives because it, 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 is, it is true that at the beginning we have a lot of challenge, a lot of uh, like problems to resolve conflicts, but then after one or two years, you are going to see that your seed is going to grow uh, and it's going to show like, a, a, the, like I say, the seed of hope no? that can make you like give you the hope to keep doing to, in the future. Thank you very much. What an inspiration. And your project is truly inspirational. And I'm very glad that you could share it with us today. And I remember when I first learned about it, I was immediately uh, tuned in and like uh, absolutely motivated. Any more questions in the chat box? Uh, so now it's over to you guys if you want to switch to the discussion or collect more questions. Well, I think that <laughs> we are on the time of uh, of the discussion, thinking about the rundown. So uh, I don't know if maybe you uh, explain again, Elisa, or or you, do you want me to explain the, the methodology for the for doing this? Sure. Uh, it, it, would you would you like to explain? Do you have any slides about it? No. I don't have it right now, but uh, mm -hmm. as, as I mentioned at the, at the beginning of the oral presentation, now uh, we want you to like uh, follow this reflection on the on the concepts and also well on, on the a small um, presentation of our experience. So we're going to split into uh, small groups, like five or six uh, uh, participant groups. We're going to uh, use the breakout groups uh, Zoom of Zoom, and uh, we want you to kindly uh, answer and discuss. To so feel free to express several uh, your thoughts and your opinions about some questions that we pre-designed for you. Um, we're gonna also uh, send you a mirror link for each group in order you to to have it like a like a background and and also like to you to write your thoughts because uh, we we sincerely uh, want you want to 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 know what did you uh, what did you what did you discuss so for that reason mural will be very useful to know what happened in, during this this discussion and also to make may, maybe some kind of document where uh, we can um like uh, get the whole of the years and try to write uh, something about this session. So as I told you, you're gonna be to the, to the groups. We're gonna send you the Zoom links. We're gonna give you about 30 to 35 minutes to discuss. And then we are gonna come back and we are gonna randomly select some people to kindly uh, give us like a feedback and, uh, and also to, to tell us like some of the, the ideas and that will be the, the end of our watch. So I hope it is okay for everyone here. Great, thank you, Alejandro. I've just added here the links to the mural uh, mural groups, and Vivian is going to allocate you each to a group. You will have some facilitators around to help you in case, um, or just to get the conversation going. Um, if, if you need to, but we will be around going between different groups. Feel free to start this conversation, introduce yourselves and know the members of your, your small group and start discussing the different that um, Pilar and Alejandro have prepared for you. Okay, and I, I think, sorry, I go ahead. To, to tell, sorry, Liz, I forget to tell that Pilar and I will be like, uh, jumping through the groups, uh, directly interacting with you, directly like exchanging some ideas to know from you. So please do not be uh, surprised when you see this is <laughs> inside of the, in the groups. Okay. So that's it. Thank you. I think uh, so. Vivian will start allocating you soon.
and you'll be able to join your group. So make sure you pick a facilitator uh, within your group and a note taker so you guys can really start this discussion uh, and make sure that everybody talks. All right, now here you go. Everybody can go. Move to the next presenter from my group seven. Thank you, Farina. Hello. Hello. Uh, and. Uh, uh, yes, I don't know. We can hear you. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna explain uh, the second one. Uh, so it means uh, livestock influencing lakes. Uh, in uh, in Mongolia, so we have uh, 60 million livestock. It's very huge, and uh, uh, some lakes are very uh, influencing in lakes because uh, in Mongolia it's very a lot of uh, lakes. We have a lot of livestock, and uh, these lakes uh, every summer is breeding birds, and so. Mayutori is very good places, and uh, every summer is a lot of livestock is very influencing, and livestock and the dogs, and uh, we can management good protect and uh, good uh, management, and uh, because uh, and this breeding time is very important, and so. Uh, Attacking uh, livestock uh, in birds' nests, that is very difficult for birds and uh, as a dogs. I saw the one camera, camera trap is pictures. I saw the dog is playing a uh, white nipple cranny's egg. And uh, yeah, we can. Uh, talk to shepherds, shepherds, uh, uh, how we can management uh, good um, good management for the livestock and springtime is uh, very important for birds and so this is springtime we have to uh, good management for livestock because birds breeding this time. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Tulma. Interesting uh, reflection on the main challenge. And so I think, I believe yeah. the livestock yeah. is not a matter of Mongolia, but um, also a matter of the whole world. Uh, because in the, they say that actually livestock has more land than people right now in the whole world and in our countries like Mexico and Colombia. So I, I, I really share this affair with you. Thank you. So if anyone want to talk from the group seven, very, very briefly to talk about the last the point, the last uh, column, the learned lessons from the group seven. Uh, yes, I'll be talking about the last questions. So the main lesson that we learned from our first experience with community-based project is that we need to listen, involve, and to communicate with the communities. And one of the examples given by uh, Doma is that we actually have to talk to the, not just community, but as far as the livestock owner, because um, livestock owner is usually where their sheep and the dogs will be disturbing the nesting birds and he also sh um, mentioned that there are camera traps actually showing pictures of dogs eating the bird eggs so these are one of the things that we need to keep in mind and for within our groups that we need to have a great coordination and managements are, are necessarily when engaging with the communities so uh, another point is that when we are talking to the communities we have to um, put down our ego 
and actually talk to them and to see from that perspective and to also consider all the major and minor factors that are having in these projects. And because when we're engaging with the community, they might be of coming from different culture, having different beliefs as well as languages, uh, languages and to acknowledge the difference and sometimes their lifestyle or their practices are related to the biodiversity of this area. And these are the knowledge that we can actually learn by engaging them. And the last point is that we need to engage the people by making engaging activities. Uh, one example given by um, Farley is that we have a board games when engaging the people to make the activity fun and more creative. Yeah, that's all. Fantastic. Thank you, Kathleen. I, I would like to, to ask for the group number six to share you ask very briefly your thoughts. Thanks for the group number seven. It's very, very insightful and very interesting what you tell us right now. So I believe group six is sharing uh, the, the, the screen. So let's talk, listen to someone from the group six that tell us about what they, what they discuss. Um, good day, everyone. I am Sandy Limlingan from the Philippines. And on behalf of my groupmates, um, Viet An Nguyen from Vietnam, Nur Hafiza Ahmad from Malaysia, and Mariana, Mariana from Mexico, here is our um, output from our group discussion earlier. So for the first question, um, what should be the role of youth on community-based conservation projects? And is there a specific task where youth must be involved? Um, our thoughts are um, youth should be involved in the whole process um, from the participative process until the implementation and monitoring aspect of the project. Um, second is, um, youth of course bring so much and they carry a lot of energy and motivation so um, it is something that youth could offer in a community-based conservation project and yeah that would be for the first question and for the second uh, what are the main challenges or obstacles and motivations for youth to involve in community-based conservation project. So first, um, one of the obstacles is the experience in engaging with communities. Of course, um, youth are young, so some, some of us doesn't have vast experience in terms of engaging with different community-based projects, so it is a, a challenge. Um, but the thing is that um, youth is very much motivated to participate and to to take action because um, youth is um, youth is the future and we are the ones who are gonna uh, manage and live in the community that will be left to us by the older generation and yeah, another challenge is that they usually are not taken into account for decision making. So this is something that involves um, age because not all, but some of the um, older people, they think that um, youth doesn't know much because they are still young. But we beg to... to, to to, to disagree, be, I we beg to agree with them because um, youth are are so much more um, like open to learning. So a lot of youth are are <clears throat> are very much in uh, very much interested to get involved. And what are the learned lessons related to previous experiences with community based projects? So um, first is it, it is very important that um, it is very important for education and awareness 
to be shared among the local communities. And second, um, the, we should also consider the perspective of how the members of the community see the importance of the environmental area being concerned. So we should be able to see it in different aspects, like economically, socially, and of course, environmentally. And um, we, we should also consider the willingness of the members of the community to participate in the conservation. And finally, we should also consider the short-term and long-term effects of our conservation-based projects to the community. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you to the group seats. Alejandro, I think he's talking, but <laughs> we don't listen to you. Oh, excuse me. Thank you for the group six and for the and for the speaker. Now we're coming to the group five. I just suggest you to, to be very brief, like just two minutes, because we want to hear from the whole groups. So please, group five, go ahead. Okay. Hello. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes, we hear you, Jason. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone from Malaysia side. Uh, we are group five and today we want to present on what we discussed earlier and we'll try to keep it under two to three minutes. So for the first question, right, um, I think what's the role that we should play? Our team believes that we should, our role is to encourage other youth and to engage in conservation work because a young person telling a young person what to do is a lot more effective than compared to uh, people with, uh, how do you say, edge gap. And we also believe that our role is to lead the conservation strategies because it's our future and we will, um, uh, take, uh, we will be there right, to uh, address any situations in the future. And uh, thirdly, uh, we, should also, we believe that we should also contribute to more uh, labor intensive uh, work that includes the sampling and going down to the village to uh, communicate with them. This is because uh, we also believe that we are young, we have a lot of energy, and you have a higher tolerance for this content. That's why that's we will make a very effective of all these things. So what are the main challenges? Uh, we believe is to uh, get the approval of elders. Uh, still, uh, we are young, among young people, right? We are still not taken seriously sometimes. Um, to get trust in the community, which I'll elaborate later. Funding, funding is always the issue. Um, a lot of uh, organizations sometimes don't trust us, uh, but sometimes we get past this by joining an NGO. And lastly, um, this is something that doesn't happen much in Borneo, but I understand it happens in uh, some other countries. There's the access to communities given the bad weather. Sometimes the weather, the storms will stop you from going somewhere. And our motivation is that um, that uh, we are working for the future and the next generation generations, which is um, something that we are there to still see. And what is the lesson that we've learned? Um, I'm gonna elaborate this, that distrust, especially in Borneo, the locals here had a lot, had a lot of, uh, was burned a lot of times by private companies. So we have to get their trust by really uh, spending time with them. It can be expensive and uh, a bit of time consuming. And um, we also have to, what we also learned that we have to have a project that has mutual, mutual interests and benefits. And lastly, it is um, important to listen to what the locals want and what they need instead of telling them what you want and from me. And that's all from my side. Um, my teammates, do you have anything to add? No? Uh, nothing. But yeah, it's just that that we need to really collaborate with the local community for the project for the community based project to be more uh, viable and it to, for the conservation to be more effective and sustainable. It's really effective to have the community involved, every aspect of the community community like the elders and the youth. So yeah, that's it. Thank you, thank you, Carmi. Thank you, Jason. Um, and thank you for the whole group. 
five. Now we're going to hear from the group four, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Okay, so hi, I'm Nina from the Philippines and Chan will be uh, helping me uh, present our discussion. So for, for the first question, we looked at it in the sense that how can the youth as part of the organizers, um, like like what's the, what can they um, bring to the table and how can the youth, what can the youth within the communities also bring to the table? So um, as an organ, as youth and as an organizer, it's easy for us to um, talk to people from the same age. So when we're the ones engaging with the communities, we feel that um, the younger people within the community also want to engage with us because we have the same, uh, we're from the same generation, we understand um, the same thing, we understand things in the same way. And then because we can talk to the youth within the community, it's easier for us to reach the older people in those communities because um, when you talk to like children or when you talk to younger people, they want to engage their parents in with what we want them to, you know, engage with for the for the project. And then in, in relation to that, our age range makes it easier for us. Like we're, we're more skilled with technology, so we can use this technology to connect us with the community and also connect us with um, a network like, like what we're doing with the forum in the for right now and then because we know how to use the technology it's also easier for us to teach it to the community and allow them to empower themselves using that and then this technology can also help with how we engage with the community how we teach um things about restoration maybe about like mangroves or whatever it is about wetlands that we want to teach them about so uh, Chen will talk about the rest of our um, discussion. Right. Thank okay. you, Janina. Thank you, Nina. Right. So uh, I'll just keep it short to, to make sure that we have more time for the other group. So uh, as for the uh, challenges and obstacles that um, you know, the youth face, um, the youth might not be interested um, perhaps due to uh, you know uh, lack of exposure, or they might not know um, if there is an availability of such project, and um, the youth might not understand or might not see the benefit of uh, joining such project. So that could be the you know the challenge and obstacles why we sometimes uh, lack of the participation of youth in uh, community-based conservation project. But secondly, um, the youth might not have uh, confidence or perhaps uh, they don't have a youth-friendly platform to engage or uh, to communicate with their community, right? And uh, perhaps um, lack of, uh, you know, a good leader to, to start a lead. Yeah, we understand that youth can be, uh, could take some lead, but then um, I believe we would need some, you know, guidance to, to perhaps initiate or to guide them along and to involve, started to involve in a in conservation project, right? So, because um, uh, as my team uh, in, in our team discussion, we, we think that we, so far we have, we have only seen, you know, the experience uh, from more senior, senior people or uh, conservation organizers, they engage with, uh, with communities. And then as for the um, lesson learned related to previous experience, um, we think that long-term um, and honest engagement with the community is really, really important because we will need you know, their feedback for the projects for any event. And then we also need to know um, the uh, knowledge gap. I believe you know, the other group also presented the same point. Uh, the knowledge gap between you know, the project teams and, uh, and the community that's why uh, it, it, it takes up long time to establish all this. And then um, our uh, another point is that we think that incentive is very important for a community-based project. So incentive, it doesn't only uh, come from, you know, the, the money basis, but it's also uh, sometimes uh, it can be 
extra material, some product, and also the opportunity to join something else, you know, some event. Um, yeah, and, and the opportunity for, you know, the capacity building activities to empower, to empower the local community. Right, I guess that's so far for group pop. Thank you. Thank you, Fung Lin. And thank you for the group four. Uh, I will ask uh, for the group three, and I will uh, to to expose them their their. Oh, I see that it's it's on blank. Maybe they think no. that we were the group three, <laughs> so this is why no, it's uh, nothing. Yeah, there is no um, people in group three, so yeah, just skip that. <laughs> so we go through group. Who? Oh, hello. Okay. I'm 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 Aaron from Group Two, and let me let me look at the notes first. Um, actually, uh, I feel like in in Hong Kong, because I'm I am from Hong Kong, so the uh youth is actually quite uh I think quite crucial to 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 driving others to join the community based work because like. Uh, I think the, there are a few different obstacles to motivate youths to involve in the projects in different ages. Because in secondary schools, most of the uh, teenagers are working on their their uh, public their, their their exams, and they have a tight schedules on studying. So it's really hard to involve in them to be a part of the conservation projects because it, it takes like half or a full days for their their weekend so it is really like nearly impossible to to involve many of them but in university it's much easier because like some of the uh students are really studying in in the related studies uh, related uh subjects like environmental science and ecology so it is quite it is easier to involve in them as a like internships uh, or uh, volunteers on on the community based work, and I I feel like it is uh they are important to but at the point of like uh it influence others teenagers in the society to join the con conservations too because like in uh. I I had I I was a volunteer in the Hong Kong Wetland Park, and I get to know this uh, volunteer scheme because I just I just live near the Hong Kong Wetland Park, and I somehow saw the poster outside the park. And the park at that time never like approached the people or teenagers in schools or in the so in the community. So they in in at that time the volunteer scheme is lack of some uh, youth peoples, but after like few years transform transformation they have they evolve more schools into their their volunteer schemes and they those teenagers just try to like promoting the volunteer scheme in different ways maybe uh, from social platforms by making videos artwork uh, to attract other uh peoples or youth to engage this uh, wetland conservation volunteer scheme so i think the youth is uh, taking a very crucial role in in promotions, and besides, they they can also uh make some other forms of conservation works, uh like carnivals or other uh carnivals or others, like like what I've said, some virtuals, uh maybe some of the uh virtuals virtual conservation works. I mean I mean like uh maybe make it by making videos because they. They they will have they have other creativities and techniques by making these uh, education works uh, to be to come true. And in previous in my previous experience, uh, I I've actually visited other countries uh, like few years ago, so like in in Bali and Sumatra is totally different from Hong Kong because Hong Kong is kind of small places and it is quite quite and and some most of the peoples uh are educated and they they will know uh it is kind kind of important to protect our environments and organisms uh but some of the p 
people maybe I I I I've been Bali and Cambodia. They even like poaching birds for 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 money or hunt birds for bush meat. So it's kind of different different uh aspect for me because you you have to spend more time on educating them because in Hong Kong most of them has a basic knowledge on some of the organisms or some why why the why this is important to protect the environment. But in, but in some places that I've been. Like Bali, they they don't even know why they have to protect the Bali starling from being poaching because they think this is a like kind of rituals, uh, fortunes. They they trust this is a kind of the poaching and like keeping the bird in their house will bring them fortune. So it's kind of difficult to to explaining why it is important to keep them in wild and uh, how how to do it. And I I worked in a village for a summer, and it's it's quite quite difficult. We spend most of the time to explain them, uh, how to why we should keep them and their conservation status of the minor to the locals. And this uh assessed to be like they 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 are the community chain activities, and they. They 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 even treat the Bali starling in the wild as a kind of like attractions to the tourists. So it, but it takes re- it takes really long time to change their mind compared to my hometown's conservation. I mean community based conservation work. So I feel like the obstacles and the challenges is just different among regions. Yes, this is what I've 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 learned from the from the talk and the discussions. Thank you, and thank you for the result of the group too. I would ask to the organizers if we have enough time for listening to the group one. I believe we can. Hi. We are. Uh, uh, sorry. Yeah. yeah, please go ahead. I think it's important. So what we have one more. We're a little bit over time, but if everybody's okay, we can hear the last group. Thank you, Liz. And excuse me, uh, John. You can go ahead. We we'll listen to All you. Right. Okay, sure. Thank you. Hi, I'm Wu from Malaysia. So I'm glad to have a very good teammate here for the discussion. Uh, Yo-Yo, uh, you know from Indonesia, Cameroon, uh, Anthony from Cameroon, and of course our amazing facilitator, uh, Nick. Uh, I'm not sure where you are from. So yes, so let's get straight forward. Um, what is the role of youth is for us, we have discussed that youth play a role of initiating as an, organization, uh, as an organizer or even assisting as a facilitator. So the main point here will be the, for the youth is to get involved, get on the ground and experience it. So, so that the, youth, the young people will know the needs uh, from the young generation of, uh, of the local people of what they really need. So we can help to encourage the preservation of local culture and products uh, with the advance of technology that will link back to the biodiversity and of course the species management. Of course, uh, after that, youth can always help to spread the awareness which become part of the conservation process. So for, uh, for the challenges, I, I think basically uh, all the groups uh, that have presented have the, quite, have the same points here. Like for example, the main thing I can spot is uh, the funding resources, that we really need funding resources to continue everything in terms of what we're doing. So for us, we think that we, uh, there are no local platforms to showcase good projects, uh, good community projects, which actually lead to no transparency of sharing information when there are no transfer, transparency of sharing information, there will be no exchange of flow of ideas and group approaches uh, between between researchers, between conservationists, and when we uh, and and when there are no platforms to, for us to get going together, when we meet together, so um, we can't share what we are doing. Of course, when there are no funding, the continuation of engagement with the communities uh, will reduce. So uh, that kind of uh, give a very negative impact to what we have established the relationship with the local people. Because like for, uh, for us in Malaysia, the organization that I attach with, we always take the saying of, uh, if we want to do a, conserva- a, a community project, we need at least five years to, es- to establish a good relationship with them, a stable one. So uh, the last thing that here, the barrier, uh, the, the, the challenges is the language, which I think few groups have mentioned. So language is one of the barriers when it comes to research information because when global, uh, in terms of global research information, it's always in English language. But when it comes to local people, which 
most of them doesn't have a high education. So they, they, uh, it's kind of a barrier for them to understand with English. So uh, it would be good if we can develop all this research information in terms of uh, in, in, in the local language. So, um, and then when we say what the lesson we can learn is we learn that local people are the living of the land. So they are the mastery of the land, they manage the land. So we need to engage and capacity build them. We also have this unique local link to all the natural resources and the species uh, that they are co-assist with. So this is what uh, we, 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 this become a unique uh, point and activities that actually attract outsiders and attract city people and it become a awareness attention to, uh, to, towards all the biodiversity and the landscape management conservation. But above all, uh, above all of this, we need to initiate the dialogue first. The dialogue is very important in, in, in order to establish relationship with local people. And not, not, also, not only local people, but also the local multi-stakeholders, which we include local people in the local multi-stakeholders. Like we have the government agency, we have the ministries, we have the NGOs and other uh, corporate business people. But we must, uh, we must involve local people as the stakeholders also. So I think that's all from uh, group one. Uh, if my teammates have, anyone, uh, have any to uh, add on, so please do so. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. I think those are very accurate thoughts and very insightful reflections about what are the main obstacles and challenges. Uh, I think we are now like getting very close to the end. Uh, I will say that I am very glad to hear from all of you. Uh, you told us a lot of different phrases and words that I can I, I have to to repeat to read it again. The good thing is that I have your mural, so I have I I, I will have enough time in my house to to read you again. I will just say just as a, as a last um, reflection that when I hear to you, I see that the challenges are very very difficult and very the barriers are so so difficult to 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 surpass uh, someone says that we we are in a culture of distrust and that the elder ones uh, doesn't want you to participate and i i i, re I remember this this pyramid i will show you again because that's why that's what i i i i just think it is that we are like in this kind of pyramid of the of the participation scheme. We are trying to uh, go through the the. Okay, excuse me. We are trying to go from the nominal uh, part just to see that we are participating, but not real a real participation because we don't have that kind of power to do these things that we want to do. So uh, for me, the matter is to look forward and to see how we can gain more power, more tools, more, um, uh, um, yes, the more levels of control to uh, start to represent, to go further and to, and, to, and to start to transform. Someone just say that we have to transform the way we see our land, the way we see our resources and the way we see of um, uh, uh, our our ecosystem so that's the final um, reflection I, I will want to share I uh, thank you at all and I will give my uh, the word to my colleague Pilar in order to to her to, to share to share to you some of last words thank you and, and, and good night for everyone Thank you, Alejandro. Uh, well, uh, these uh, ideas that you shared with us are really, really uh, nice uh, to, to, to know about your experience, your uh, desires about uh, what can you, uh, what could you do with the, in these kind of projects, no? John are really, really, 
<laughs> like um, uh, have uh, are an actor really really relevant in any project of conservation because you are in the like in the middle of the transition between <laughs> be be child and, and and be adults and as you are plenty of energy you can uh, push many many things uh, to other uh, to uh, people older and also to teach uh, the 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 kids no that's it's really important as you can see in no matter where <laughs> we are, we are facing really critical uh, environmental problems. So we need that more people get involved in all kind of initiatives where related with conservation, with restoration, with management. So uh, we, we we promote, uh, we want to promote in, in you the, the spirit of a perseverer and and stay in, in touch uh, related with all these topics uh, it's really important to get uh, accurate information also to share with the people in, in the localities where you are participating or you are working uh, it's really important the, the 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 role that that you can play in in, in your localities and thank you for, for being this day with us. Uh, we hope that you have enjoyed our presentation. And well, uh, good luck for everyone. Be safe. And thank you so much again. Thank you very much, Alejandro and Pilar. What a wonderful session. It was fascinating. We learned a lot from both of you in the start and then from the participants themselves in the discussion. Um, I'd like everybody, we, we, normally we would be doing a round of applause. Uh, we can do it virtually still if you click on the reactions. I'm going to put like my little hands there. <laughs> um, it was a excellent session here together uh, and I'm really glad that we could share this moment. Um, and I really like the key messages that you guys um, in, have shared with us and we really found um, I think uh, applicable to anybody anywhere uh, working with local communities. So thank you very much. I'm just going to, oops, wrong one. <laughs> uh, remind everybody of the next sessions that are coming up. So the next session that you'll have starting at 2 p.m. is with uh, Professor Richard Fuller from University of Queensland in Australia. Um, and he is going to give you a um, training session on field research and monitoring. So initially this session was uh, up, um, a choice between one or two. Um, Ms. Uh, Professor Fuller, however, has um, indicated that he's happy for more people to join. So if you haven't signed up for the session and still wish to attend, the link is already in the Whova platform. So you can go there and click, uh, click on it. And um, for Sefa's session in the afternoon on environmental justice, engaging marginalized youth, there's still some space, spaces for that particular uh, training workshop. So if you want to join, please send a message over to, um, over to us um, at the Flyway Youth Forum at gmail.com and we can add you. Um, and finally, just a quick uh, rectification of the hour of the party. I'm sorry, I gave the wrong hour at the beginning. Um, it's going to be at 7.30 Korean Standard Time. And I hope you can all join for this uh, nice celebration. Thanks again to the trainers and thank you all to the participants. Uh, uh, before leaving, Alejandro want, would like to have, have a screenshot of all the participants. I think that's a wonderful idea. I'll stop sharing my screen. And let's, if everybody take, uh, put their video on and, and we can take a quick picture. All right, everybody's video is coming on little by little. It's wonderful to see all your faces, all your smiling faces. <laughs> let's see, I'm gonna check if all the are open. Can somebody maybe, uh, the organizing team help me take a few pictures? Like this, we'll be able to make sure we have enough pictures. All right. So uh, one, two, three, and then we can say wetlands. <laughs> Ready? 
One, two, three, wetlands, teas. <laughs> yeah. And now uh, you can do a uh, handshake. <laughs> Ready? One, two, three, funny handshake. <laughs> Very good. Excellent. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks a lot, everybody. We hope you have a nice uh, rest of the morning. Rest a little bit before your next session, and then we'll find you again there. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you.